Okay, um, we've got nearly 100 here now, so we'll get started. Um, you'll be relieved to know we're recording from the beginning today. Um, when you look on Blackboard, you will find that the recording for yesterday's lecture is in two parts. Uh, there's a part which was recorded after the lecture, which covers the first eight or nine slides, and then the live session kicks in um, when it was pointed out to me uh, helpfully by somebody that we were not recording. There's a little bit of overlap between the two sections, so you may have the same slide in more than once in the overlap, which means you'll hear that information twice. But it is all there, it's just in two parts. Okay, we're now going to spend a second lecture looking at extrusion. Um, in particular, we're going to be looking at how to do some simple calculations on extrusion loads. So if we recap yesterday, we started out by looking at mechanical testing and material properties that were relevant to forming operations. So we looked at the simple tensile test. We looked at the bulge test and the compression test. We looked at the differences between true, true stress and true strain and engineering stress and engineering strain and why true stress and true strain are more useful for forming operations. We then started having a look at extrusion, a general overview, uh, looking at the types of extrusion operation. And then right at the end of the lecture, we looked at the load displacement response, the RAM load versus RAM displacement response of a typical extrusion operation, be it forward extrusion or reversed extrusion, and worked out that it was a little bit more complicated than it might at first seem, because there's quite a lot going on when you extrude a billet through a die. Today, we're going to go on and we're going to start by making some definitions of quantities that we use in extrusion. Then we're going to do some simple analyses to estimate the extrusion forces during uh, a forward extrusion operation. Then we're going to go on and look at a slightly more sophisticated correlation between uh, extrusion force uh, and mechanical properties, which takes account of some of the things that happen in real extrusion, like friction. And then having done that, we will start looking at common defects during extrusion, things that can go wrong when you try and extrude a component. So we start off by generating what we call deformation criteria, some criteria for saying how much we are deforming our extrude um, when we produce our component. And the first one of these is very simple. It's the, called the extrusion ratio. And it's the ratio of the cross-sectional area of the billet that you start with, which the ram pushes against, and the cross-sectional area of the extrude that comes out at the end. And of course, that is by definition the same as the area of the die, the area of the cross-sectional area of the shape that you are creating in the die. So this is a simple definition. The extrusion ratio is A0 over AE. Now, there's another quantity that we use. We call it the reduction. And again, this is a simple definition. It's the initial area minus the final area over the initial area. So the billet cross-sectional area minus the extrude cross-sectional area divided by the billet cross-sectional area. And of course, as you can see there, you can rearrange it. So it's actually one minus AE over AO and AE over AO is one over the extrusion ratio. So those are two simple definitions. They are merely definitions of quantities that are sort of related to strain. The other thing to start thinking about at the beginning is how the dimensions of the, of the original billet relate to the dimensions of the component that you extrude out. And the key thing here is conservation of volume. 
So you'll start out with a billet that has a cross-sectional area A0 and a length L. Typically, this will be a cylinder that you've stuck into a chamber and it's been pushed out by a punch. Then you'll have an extrude which has a cross-sectional area AE, which of course can be quite a complex shape, but let's just deal with the cross-sectional area. And that has a length LE. And if we assume, to make things simple, that the entire billet gets extruded through the die, there's nothing left inside as waste. And as we know, that's, that's not quite true, but it's good enough for a simple calculation then we can say this is a constant volume process. We're plastically deforming the material, which we know is a constant volume process, and we're using it all up, which is our simple assumption. We're not scraping any off, throwing it away. What goes in must come out. And that means that we know that the volume of the original billet is the same as the volume of the extrude. A naught, L naught, is equal to A E L E. And that's just conservation of volume. We've assumed we've pushed it all out through the die and we haven't lost any of it. So we've got three simple definitions, and this is one of them. And here's another picture of the same thing going on. A billet of length L naught with area A naught is pushed through a die that you can just about see there. You end up with an extruded length L E and an area A E. So that's just saying exactly what the previous slide said. So now we know these things, we can actually start to make an estimate of how much work is done by the ram during extrusion. Um, because you're using up energy uh, to deform the material, and that energy is coming from the work that's done by the ram moving. So over on the right, we've got a stress strain curve for the material. Um, so you've got stress on the y axis, strain on the x axis. This is probably a true stress, true strain curve. And I'm showing a strain increment delta epsilon at a particular stress level. So if we go back to our RAM, the work that the RAM does in deforming the billet by an amount DL is the load times the increment of displacement. And that's just simple force time displacement, work done. The work done is PDL, where P is the total RAM force and DL is the increment of movement of the RAM. But what we know is P is sigma times A, where A is the cross-sectional area of the billet that the RAM's pushing on. And sigma is the stress that's acting over that cross section, because that's the definitions of stress, load and area together. So we can work out the work done per unit volume. And what you've got there is PDL, which is the work done on the top on the left hand side, AL, which is the total volume. Uh, AL, the instantaneous area times the instantaneous length. And you can see that that is equal to P over A, which is stress, times DL over A, which is delta epsilon, is the, the increment of strain, the change in length over the current length. So if you remember back to the previous lecture, that's a definition of strain. So we've now got a relationship between the dimensions of the billet, the load, and actually the stress strain curve. So A and L are the current values of area and length. So what we can now do is we can integrate that up to generate the total work per unit volume. And what we're doing there is we're actually integrating the stress strain curve. So we're integrating this current level of stress uh, between L0 and LE, uh, and that's, you've got a DL over L there, so you can see that you're integrating the equation that's halfway up that slide, and that works out as sigma log E L epsilon over L0.
So we now have a relationship between the total work done we've got a, uh, and the, the uh, stress. So what can we do with that? Well, we can now go on. If we say that the stress is not an instantaneous stress that's changing all the time you go up the stress strain curve, but it's an average yield stress, the flow stress that we talked about yesterday. Let's assume that sigma is y bar, which is a constant. That means that the total work done is A naught L naught, which is the total volume, times the flow stress, times log L E over L naught. And you do that by substituting into this equation on the end of the previous page. So the work done by the punch, total work done by the punch, is force times total displacement. And because we've said that the stress is constant, because it's equal to the flow stress, that means the load is constant. So the work done is just the average load, the constant load, times the total length over which it operates. Work done, load times displacement. Once you know that, you can rearrange and you get the load equals A naught times the flow stress times the log of the extrude length over the initial length. And you can also then, uh, by saying that uh, the pressure is P over A naught, you can rearrange and say P over, which is the pressure, not the load, P, which is big P over A naught, over Y bar, which is the flow stress, is equal to the log of L E over L naught. And that's another simple rearrangement. So that's our punch pressure, P, P over A naught. Volume continuity says that we know that the volume doesn't change. We also have a definition of the reduction R equals 1 minus A E over L A naught, which equals 1 minus L naught over A E. And that follows because A naught L naught equals A E L E. So we end up with that simple equation. The punch pressure divided by the flow stress is equal to the log of 1 over 1 minus the reduction. Which is actually very simple, and that's just a simple work done calculation. And we can use that to do some sums. Now, while it's simple, it's not correct um, because he underestimates the extrusion load. And the reason for that is that actually that very simple theory is not accounting for all the work you do, all the energy you dissipate, because you dissipate energy overcoming friction. And all that is lost. You've also got something called redundant work. And redundant work refers to what you need to do to change the size and shape of the metal as it proceeds through the plastic region of the billet and into the die. So we've got stuff going on inside the billet behind the die that we haven't taken account of. So this is always an underestimate. So can we do better than that? Well, a gentleman called Johnson uh, has come up with something that allows us to do a little bit better. And what he did was some experiments. So rather than a very simple piece of theory, he did some experiments to see how far we deviate from that very simple theory. And he took some metals which had very, very low work hardening, such as lead or pure aluminium. In other words, the flow stress is equal to the yield strength. They don't work harden. So this assumption about constant flow stress is a really good one. They're an elastic, perfectly plastic material, um, which means their hardening modulus, if you, again, if you remember from yesterday's lecture, is zero. So the first step in the approach is to define the extrusion load, P, and the average yield or flow stress, Y bar, which uh, we know. And we can then decide what we want to use for that. Because of course the extrusion load does in reality change as you push the billet 
through the die. So which load represents the extrusion process? Now, regions one, two, three, and four uh, on forward extrusion have got some friction in them. So region four is sloping downwards because in the punch load versus travel, you're actually scraping the billet against the side of the um, chamber at that point. Uh, regions one, two, and three are where you're coining. So you're actually changing the shape of the billet to fit inside the die, and you're not actually doing any work to push it through the die yet. And region six and seven, you shouldn't be in anyway, uh, because you're going to end up smashing your die if you do that. So what he came up with is 0.5, is the uh, the load pretty well at the end of the steady state region with minimum friction. Um, and that represents steady state conditions. That represents most of the process where you have set up the extrude coming out and you're just pushing the billet in and the extrude is coming out. You haven't got the setting up and ending problems going on. And of course, 0.5 is a good representation of reverse extrusion because reverse extrusion has much less frictional force involved. So that's what he did. He also, of course, and this is a little bit of re uh, revision, he needed to know what the stress strain response of the material was. And of course, he used compression tests, which we talked about yesterday. He took pure lead, he did compression tests to get the stress strain curve. And of course, here's a picture we might remember from yesterday. You start out with a nice cylinder of height H naught and area A naught. You squash it and it changes to area A and it changes to area H. And of course, if it remained purely cylindrical, AH would be equal to A naught H naught, but it doesn't unless you lubricate it properly. And so you end up with the concentric groove problem uh, where you actually have take great care to lubricate your compression test to ensure that you don't get barreling. Okay, so the average yield stress is the next thing we need. Here is a stress strain curve, and you can see that you've got a yield strength Y, which is presumably an engineering yield, uh, well, sigma Y, I'd call it, but, um, and you've got a flow stress. And why the flow stress is defined as the average value of the stress over the range of true strain achieved during the extrusion operation. In other words, if you go up to a strain of E1, then Y bar is the average value of the flow stress over that region. Johnson got around this problem by basically using materials that have a flat stress strain curve with no work hardening. So there's a typical true stress versus true strain curve for uniaxial compression with the elastic region removed. And you can, you can basically work out Y bar by integrating um, sigma d epsilon over the range of strain you're interested in. Here it's naught to E1. So sigma you get off the stress strain curve. All you're doing is working out the area under that curve and saying what's the average height of a rectangle with the same area as that stress strain curve, uh, which uh, has got a width equal to E1. So that's all that calculation is doing. That gives you your flow stress. And E1 is the log of A0 over A1, which is actually the same as the log of L1 over L0, which is the definition of true strain. And this is what he came up with. He's plotted the pressure over the flow stress against the log of one over one minus R, which we remember from our simple calculation earlier. And he's got a straight line, which is great because if it's a straight line, you can have two coefficients. You can have a slope and an intercept. So there's an intercept A and a slope B, and this is for lead. So he got A is 0 0.8 and B is 1.5. That means that there's an empirical relationship. Pressure over flow stress is a constant A plus a coefficient B times the log of one over one minus R. So you can see it's a little bit more complicated than the simple calculation that we did, which ignored friction. This is called Johnson's equation. And um, 
in, I think if you come to the forming tutorial, we'll be doing some sums using Johnson's equation, but we'll do something now as well. Um, the key thing about this is if we've got a material, uh, we can do a few tests on the material to get the constants A and B, and then ideally we can apply those A's and B to other reductions, uh, other designs of uh, extrude because we've looked at the material and we have tested it over a range of reductions and we can use different extrude operations for the same material and use the data we've got from these experiments to predict the loads. So it's actually quite useful. You can do a few tests and then you can apply the results of those tests to a whole range of other operations done on the same material. Okay. Let's have a worked example. So we're going to start out with a cylindrical metal billet. And that cylindrical metal billet has got a diameter of 25 millimeters and a length of 30 millimeters. So um, that means we know enough to calculate A naught and L naught. And we're extruding it through a circular 180 degree flat die of 10 millimeter diameter. So that 10 millimeter diameter allows us to calculate AL. So that means we know everything about the shape of this. We can work out A naught, L naught and AL or AELE. The average yield strength of the billet is 22 newtons per millimeter squared. So that's Y bar. So if someone has gone away and done the integration of the stress strain curve for you to work out what Y bar actually is over the sort of strain ranges you're interested in. What sort of extrusion load do you need to do that operation, as, assuming that Johnson's empirical constants apply? So that's A equals 0.8 and B equals 1.5. So what's the solution? Well, the first thing we do is to start working out the geometrical parameters. So here's L naught, pi d squared over 4, 491 millimeters squared. Here's AE, the extrude, and we, we, we get that because we know the die area, the die cross-sectional area, or the die diameter in this case, because it's a nice simple circular one. So AE is pi 10 squared over 4, pi D squared over 4. So we know A naught and AE. So we now know the reduction. Um, the reduction is defined as A naught minus AE over A naught, and that comes out at 0.84. So we can rearrange that to the parameter we want for Johnson's equation, which is 1 over 1 minus R, and that's equal to 6.25. So we've now got a reduction, and therefore we've characterized our extrusion process, and we've got that just from knowing the dimensions of the extrude and the dimensions of the billet. Okay, now let's assume that Johnson's equation applies. So here is Johnson's equation. So what we've got there is the punch pressure P divided by the flow stress, which we know is 22. And then there's the constant in Johnston's equation, 0.8, the coefficient, 1.5 and Johnson's equation is based on the natural log of 1 over 1 minus r which is why we worked it out and that gives us the answer 3.55. So that means that the actual punch load is um, 3.55 which is the arc bit that's come out of Johnson's equation times the flow stress because we need to get the flow stress that's on the bottom on the left hand side of the equation up onto the top times the cross sectional area of the billet, which we know is 491 A naught. So P is A naught times Y bar times the output of Johnson's equation, which is 38.33 kilonewtons. So we've now estimated how big our um, extrude force is. It's actually quite large. This is a very soft material with a flow stress of only 22, me 22 megapascals. A, a typical 
stainless steel is 300. Um, a typical low alloy steel is about 400. So you could see that if you try and extrude those, you're going to get very, very large loads very quickly. So that's a very simple calculation of how to get a punch load. And all we're using is simple geometrical um, information plus our knowledge of basically the work done calculations we did earlier to get that relationship of the log. OK, so that's the sort of calculation that we might ask you to do to work out the punch load. Now let's step back a bit and do a little bit of description. Um, what we're actually going to now talk about is things that can go wrong in extrusion because it doesn't always go perfectly. So let's start out with something called piping. Now, what this is showing, uh, this rather manky drawing, um, is we have a partially extruded component. So what you can see is a bit of the, the billet is left on the left hand side. And the extrude, which is smaller diameter, is on the right hand side. This has clearly been done with a 180 degree die because you can see that the billet is actually flat ended. But we've got impurities, we've got oxide skin impurities that have somehow got entrained into the extrude. And that's called piping. So basically what can happen is there's, if you're doing hot extrusion particularly, or if you're extruding material that has got corrosion on the surface for whatever reason, Maybe it's the sort of steel that corrodes really easily. Maybe you've left it out in the rain too long before you tried to extrude it. Um, maybe you were supposed to clean it up, but you didn't. Um, if you've got an oxide skin at the surface, sometimes, depending upon the flow characteristics of the billet, um, you can end up in training that oxide into the body of the extrude, uh, which we call a piping defect. It's an impurity in there. You've got a basically oxide stringers inside your extrude, which you don't really want to do. Um, now, the solution is actually very, sim very simple. Um, generally speaking, all that oxide is on the outside edge of the billet. And that's where it can actually come from. It can work its way along as you squeeze the billet, that oxide gets pushed along with the sound material. It gets entrained into the flow as it goes out through the die and it ends up in the final extrude. So what you do is you use a punch that's a slightly smaller diameter than the billet and the chamber. Um, and that collects the skin as something called a skull, because what it actually does is punches out the centre of the billet and leaves a little annulus all the way around the outside, which has got the oxide skin on it. Um, and here's a picture of what's going on. Um, so here you've got a ram on the right. You've got a workpiece or a billet in gray, which says wobbly blue work there. And in this case, what we're doing is we're actually extruding, we're forward extruding a pipe. So you can see we've got a dummy block and a mandrel, which means that the, uh, the shape of the extrude is being defined by the mandrel for its inner surface and by the die for its outer surface. But what you can see is that the dummy block at the head of the mandrel is slightly smaller diameter than the chamber. So when you push forwards, what you find is you leave behind the surface layer of the billet. It's just left against the edge of the chamber. So you're making sure that nearly all the surface oxide, or all the surface oxide is left behind and is not entrained. Um, so that's how they do that. OK. So what else can go wrong? Well, there's also something called fir tree cracking or repetitive transverse cracking. And this is an example of fir tree cracking where you've extruded a plastic rather than the metal. And you can see that you don't have a smooth surface. You've got all these little concentric uh, little cracks running around the outside of the extrude, which has created this impression a bit like a fir tree. Uh, or at least that's what they call it. Um, and you get that uh, if you have a very large reduction, a fast extrusion rate and a low melting point material. Actually, what's that 
that sounds like you're doing a lot of work and you're getting it quite close to the melting point. You're getting it too soft and sticky. Um, and one solution to it is just to do everything a little bit slower because then you won't get so hot. Um, okay, here's a slightly more interesting one, something called a rear cavity defect in forward extrusion. So this is a nice little diagram again. You've got a punch and this punch has got a little punch pad in front of it. It's pushing into the container and it's pushing the billet out through a rather simple die. You're not doing anything clever with mandrels, but you can see that a void is opening up, that white triangular region at the back of the billet. So what's going on here? Well, near the die, in the plastically deforming region of the billet, the billet material actually moves faster at the centre than it does near the container walls. There's a non-uniform velocity distribution across the billet near the die, and that's because of friction, our old friend friction. Friction is pulling back the material against the wall, which means it's moving slower, which means on average more material is flowing in from the centre of the billet to the extrude than is flowing in from the outside of the billet. And of course, if you do that in a constant volume billet, eventually you'll run out of material in the centre before you run out of material around the edges. Um, and that's exactly what happens. The billet material near the centre actually starts moving ahead of the punch. So the punch is moving at a constant speed, but the billet material in front of it is actually disappearing into the die a little bit faster than that. Um, and so you create a cavity or a void in the back of the billet. And it becomes wider and deeper as extrusion proceeds. And if you're not careful, it goes right through the die and out into the finished product. So you end up with a whole series of voids and cavities inside your final extruded component, which you generally don't want. And here is an example of a series of little extruded specimens showing cavity defects. So what we've done is we're moving from left to right. We've made, we've taken a little cylinder, uh, a billet. Uh, we have partially extruded it, which is why it looks like a T. And then we've done a cross section. So we've taken an axial cross section. So we, we basically cut it across the diameter and we're looking at the relationship between the surfaces on uh, the, the punch to billet interface. And you can see that as the punch gets longer, sorry, as the extrude gets longer and the material left in the billet gets smaller, a cavity defect forms at the back. Um, these are lead billets. So you start out with some small ones and they get longer and longer. I'm not quite sure why they get short and then long, but on average, they're getting longer and longer, more of the billets running through. And after you split them, you can see that cavity starts in the middle and grows bigger and bigger and eventually runs out through the die. So the back end of that extrude has got a big cavity defect in it. And as this slide says, as the punch gets nearer to the die, the cavity gets bigger. Um, so that's one reason maybe for stopping your punch early, although that's a bit wasteful of material. So what's going on? So let's have a look at some experiments that someone did. Uh, we're looking now at the trailing ends of those little lead specimens from the previous slide. And what we've done here is this is before we've cut them in half along the diameter. So we're looking at the surface that the punch pushed on. And you can see at the top, you've got these little concentric rings of particles in the surface. And those are little bits of brass that they embedded in the surface. So you could see how the surface material moved. And what you can see is as you move A, B, C, D, E, F, you can see all those brass particles are moving in radially because that's where on average the flow is because you're flowing down to replace material that's moving faster in the middle until they all disappear down that void 
the cavity that's forming in the middle. So that's effectively what that's, that's a very graphic representation of what's happening as a cavity forms. And you can also very easily see there's a monster cavity by the end of these. There's the cavity. So can we actually make things better by changing the shape of our punch? Because everything we've done so far assumes a flat punch. Or maybe we could make it convex or even concave. Would either of those help? Um, because that cavity defect could extend for a considerable distance into the extrude. And the risk is it actually turns into a little hairline crack, which is difficult to find. So let's see if we can make things better by changing the shape of our punch. So this is the same sort of thing that's been done again. What we've got here is a whole series of different punch designs. So over on the right hand side, seven, eight and nine, we have a concave punch. Uh, in the middle, we have convex punches. And we've also got various strange shapes. And what you notice is that if you've got a convex punch, so three is a convex punch and six is a convex punch, you make things worse. If the punch is already poking forward into where the cavity is going to form, you end up with a worse situation. You've got very large cavities in number three and number six. Whereas numbers seven, eight and nine are concave punches. So you can see that actually the back of the the billet is forming a little dome when you stop extruding. And you could see in those cases, you get much smaller cavity defects. The other interesting thing you've got in all of those is all of these has got a little steel ball in them, which you can see, let me put the thing, there's a steel ball there, a steel ball there, a steel ball there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, and one there. They start off with a little steel ball embedded in the billet at the back and you can see that with the convex punches that steel ball's got an awful long way into the extrude when you stop. With the concave punches the little steel ball's hardly moved which is consistent with the fact you're not getting as much flow. You've managed to solve your problem of flow causing a cavity defect. So you can change, you can reduce the propensity for cavity defect formation by um, using a concave punch. Okay, you'll be glad to know we've reached the end. Um, key message from today is that Johnson's empirical equation gives us a rough guide to the extrusion load required for a given material if we can do tests to establish values for its empirical constants. The other key message is that there are several different defects that you can get in extrusion but all three of the defects I've shown you have relatively simple workarounds that allow you to minimise their impact on your final extrude. OK, so that is all I have to say today. So if I stop sharing, we've got about 20 minutes for questions. So if you've got any questions you'd like to ask, please raise your hand. What I will say while you're thinking about that is that the forming tutorial uh, is going to be doing worked calculations on these, sim these very simple calculations that we can do on uh, forming operations. So uh, I would recommend going along and having a go because when you have a go at them, when you try and work through them, they make an awful lot more sense than if you just sit there watching someone derive them. OK, I've got a question from Balint. Hi, sir. Um, I would like to ask that. Uh, could you please explain what the flow stress is again? Yes, it's the average yield strength over the strain that you think you're going to be putting in. So what I'll do is I'll put up the um, PowerPoint again and show you the slide. Which means I need to actually quit that click. Escape. Right, OK, let's go to this one. That's not helpful. Um, I'm just having, just bear with me a few seconds. It decided it didn't want to share. There we go. Right, let's share this one. So hopefully you can see the slides now.
stress. If we go to the flow stress definition slide, which is not that one. Here's the definition of the flow stress, the average yield strength. So the, the definition we gave for flow stress yesterday was it is the stress you need to generate further plastic deformation for it to continue to deform. Um, and if you look at a classical stress strain curve with a yield strength and then a rising uh, plastic hardening uh, slope, then it's clear that the uh, the flow stress goes up as the strain goes up. So for a simple calculation, we want to know what the average value Out what the average value of the flow stress is. Um, and because the work done uh, is the, in the area underneath the curve, the way we work out the flow stress is to say, what's the area under the actual stress strain curve up to the strain we, 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 which we would wish to achieve. And so that's the gray area there that goes between the yield strength on the left, because we're assuming no elastic deformation, to a strain E1, that's that gray area is the work done. Um, and of course, you can get the same area with a rectangle, which has got height Y bar, which is the average flow stress, and width the, at the same strain. So it's the average stress to achieve the same work done, um, which is another way of saying it's the average stress over that increment of strain. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you, sir. Okay, Shalom. Hi, sir. Yeah. Um, with the, you said that there's a, a constant volume th through the extrusion process. Yeah. Why doesn't the density increase when it's, when it's kind of getting squished th to be thinner? Because to make the density go up, you would have to move the atoms closer together. Um, you can do that. Um, you can put pressure on something and it reacts with something called the bulk modulus. Um, but if you think about it, that is an elastic process pushing all the atoms closer together uh, and you'd require very high loads. What's going on in extrusion is plastic deformation. Uh, which is what you're doing is you're moving the dislocations around to change the shape of the material. And we know that plastic deformation takes place at constant volume because on average, the atomic bonds don't get any closer together or further apart to a good first approximation. What you're doing is uh, you're allowing dislocations to move, which allows the material to shear, but its volume doesn't change, its shape does. Right. Okay. You can, you can indeed, you know, if you put a uniform pressure on a sphere, a uniform external pressure on a sphere of steel, you could change its density, but it will be resisted by all the interatomic bonds. Um, uh, and therefore you'd be looking at something called the bulk modulus as the measure of how much stress you'd have to put on there to reduce its volume by a certain amount. And it really is a very large amount because the interatomic bonds are rather strong. Um, but a, a lower force is required just to cause it to deform. Exactly, yes, because you can move a dislocation much more easily than you can move the atoms together or apart. So I don't know how much you did in materials one, but if you try to work out the theoretical cohesive strength of a material, it's massive. Uh, you know, the, the amount of energy you need to move all the atomic planes apart to the point at which the potential energy starts to fall rather than rise again, because you've got beyond the range of the interatomic forces. Whereas in a dislocation, what you're doing is you're bumping an extra plane of atoms over the plane of that, over the, uh, a, a longer plane. You remember a dislocation definition and that doesn't require much energy the analogy that people always use is that if you want to move a really heavy carpet from one end of the room to another 
you can either drag the whole carpet at once, or you can generate a ruck in it and move the ruck from one end to the other. And, if you, and that is actually a much, much lower energy process. But at the end of it all, you've moved the carpet. And that's how dislocations work. Thank you. Um, with the, the, Johnson, the Johnson equation, how does he get, how, where do you get the values for A and B from, or is that just something you get as a given? It's experiment. Well, if we ask you to do a sum, we'll give them to you. <laughs> um, in reality, you don't do a series of experiments. So if you look at that slide you've got up there, what he's done is he's done a whole series of extrusion tests at different uh, reductions. So you've got log over one over one minus R is increasing as you go from left to right. So he's, he's done a whole series of different reductions and he's actually measured the, um, the punch loads. And because he's measured the punch loads, because he's measured the flow stress, uh, and because he knows what the area of the punch is, um, he can do, he can plot P, little p over Y bar as a function of log one over one minus R. And each of those crosses is an experiment, is an extrusion experiment that he's done. And hey presto, he can do a linear regression on that and he can get out A and B. And that, that's because you, what you looked at, if you look down at the bottom, you've modified your very simple extrusion equation, which was the log over one over one minus R by these additional coefficients. And uh, those are those are representing your, your friction and your um, and the um, redundant work. Uh, to some extent, yes, yes, yes. Not all of it. But yeah, there's there's some redundant work there. What there isn't is these strange things going on when you coin it, or when you hit the die at the other end. So it's the steady state region. Um, but yes, that's effectively taking account of some of the things that your simple theory doesn't. Um, so if you were faced with working out what the punch loads for a particular operation were, you might be lucky, you might find there was a textbook somewhere or a handbook somewhere that said someone's done the experiments on this grade of steel and this sort of die. Um, and we find we know what A and B are, which means you can go away and work out quite quickly what your punch forces should be. Um, if you haven't done that, you've got the option of doing experiments yourself uh, to calibrate Johnson's equation or possibly doing much more sophisticated numerical analysis, uh, which is something that we don't do in this course. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when's the when's the drop in session that you mentioned yesterday? Uh, it's not to, not tomorrow night. It's Thursday night and it's Thursday night at 6 p.m. OK, thank you. Um, Sadly, I'm, other, I'm double booked tomorrow evening. It would normally be Wednesday evenings. And the um, the second of the quizzes. When 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 is that? That's not that long away, actually. Um, it's uh, it, actually it's a little way away. Quiz two is on the thirteenth of May, because that way it comes after completion of the entire lecture course. Um, because it means we can actually ask you questions on all the welding lectures as well. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, so if there are no more questions, um, uh, the lecture notes are already up. Uh, the video, which we've now managed to record properly, will be up probably by late this evening or tomorrow morning. Uh, there'll be a drop-in session on Thursday evening this week if you end up with questions you want to come up with. Um, and failing all of that, I will see you for forming lecture four next Monday. Okay, so thank you one and all. Let me just stop recording. <laughs>